Um, I'm Julia Coakley, Head of Operations, and on behalf of the MGAA, I'd like to welcome you to our webinar this afternoon, which is being hosted by Green Kite. Before I introduce our presenters, I'd like to run through a few housekeeping points. Please ensure your microphone and your camera is off. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat button at the bottom of your screen, which will be answered during the panel session. If we do run out of time and don't have an opportunity to put your questions to our speakers, our presenters will be happy to pick up this post-event. As I say, please submit your questions during the panel session because it will make it all the more interesting and we want our uh, presenters to work for their money. Don't we, Sean? <laughs> um, presentation is accredited for CPD points if relevant to your ongoing professional development program. And the video will be available on our website and uploaded to our YouTube channel. We will be providing some of the slides, but also a supporting paper for the presentation post-event. Please take time to respond to our feedback survey. This will be issued after this webinar, and it does help us deliver the best quality events to our membership. So today's webinar is a panel discussion on how to transform your operational model using data and technology. And this is brought to you by GreenKite. For their panel today, GreenKite have invited business leaders, Sean Milley, founder of Bright Blue Hair, Peter Mungin, MD of Bubblegum Consulting, and Heidi McCormack, CEO and founder of Emerald Life. Additionally, we're also joined by Karen Stanford, Operations and Transformation Lead from GreenKite. Sean is an expert in practical innovation and growth for corporate entrepreneurs and leaders, focused on insurance, technology and business storytelling. She is a published author, specialist facilitator, speaker and advisor. With 28 years of senior corporate leadership prior to going independent, she has real life experience of growing, leading and failing in business. Heidi is a business leader, recognised for her thought leadership on the international stage and her career in investment banking, compliance and as a senior figure in one of the largest global automotive companies. Before co-founding Emerald, Heidi was Executive Director of New Business Development for General Motors in Russia, spearheading GM's entry into Russia and becoming a role model for women in the boardroom. Peter is responsible for providing and delivering a wide range of professional advisory services to brokers and carriers across the London market. Peter has a complete understanding of, of London market modernisation programmes and is assisting carriers and brokers to navigate through the challenges of a rapidly changing landscape. With over 40 years of international market experience and a comprehensive understanding of the London speciality market, Peter is known for his leadership roles, both in Asia Pacific and the UK. And last but by not, not no means least, Karen, helps organise define business transformation and operational improvement strategy within appropriate governance mechanisms. Able to develop pragmatic solutions to business problems, she quickly understands the business environment, determine appropriate outcomes and helps to deliver results. So Sean, if I might, I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much, Julia and uh, the MJA for inviting Green Kite to be here today. So hi, everyone. We thank you all for investing your time um, with us. And we're aiming to justify that investment with actual insights and content from both Karen Stanford, Operations and Transformation Lead for Green Kite, as you've heard, and our amazing guest panelists, Heidi and Peter. Just to say today, I'm here as a co-founding associate of Green Kite's I'm responsible for customer innovation, but my job here today is to really make sure that we get through the session to time, but also delivering all the lovely value that we've got in store for you. So we're splitting today into three parts, um, an essential scene set from Karen, an expert panel discussion with Karen, Peter and Heidi, and then a cut to the chase from Karen at the end on making data-driven technology implementations really work for you. And we'll be asking for your feedback directly in that portion of today's webinar to help really determine where and if we go further in that particular area. So let's crack on then. Um, Karen, I, if I can ask you to kick off with this first five minute segment on Blueprint 2 and CDR. We'll start there. We also have a couple of other slides to go through. There's critical six questions and six must have ingredients for an MGA digital strategy. But Karen, over to you to start off with Blueprint 2 and the core data record. Thanks. 
Thanks, Sean. Um, I think we all know there's a lot of talk of Blueprint 2. Um, there's been a lot of um, information being shared on the Delegated Contract and Oversight Manager. Um, lots of talk of DDM, access to digital trading, digital binder registration. So I suspect as an MGA, you guys will be pretty aware of the work that's actually going on to reduce the cost and effort of doing business within the London market. I think the area that you might not be as familiar with is the creation of the core data record. So Lloyd's enabled, um, Lloyd's launched this uh, a couple of weeks ago um, to enable standardised and, and quality data um, in collaboration with the cause. But they focused initially on open market North American property business and are looking to roll that out to other classes with delegated authority business being towards the end of it. Um, I think it's kind of gone under the radar that this is kind of out there at the moment. And it's really, really key that you guys go and have a look at it because the, um, the clue is in the name, core data record. So I think this is going to mean that quite a lot of the, um, the initial consultation work, binding authority business will fall off the back of what's being launched for open market property. Um, there are a number of, there are six questions that MGA firms must ask and answer in response to Blueprint 2 and the CDR development. We all know the guidance is still kind of loose by Lloyd's, but it doesn't mean we should be sitting back and not doing anything as firms. You know, the do nothing and wait option is just no longer um, a viable option. So we need to think about how we prepare for that and what interactions we need to make now and the preparation that we need to do. One thing we could do is look at how our data capture currently aligns with the core data record. We know this is all around transmitting data and making kind of seamless interactions with other firms um, and systems. So what do we have in our systems at the moment that align to the core data record and where do we need to make improvements? When you look at current data and data quality, how good is our data quality? Now we all know that we've had version 5.2 floating around in the ether for years. Um, that is a format. Just because you've got the headings doesn't mean your data is good quality. What's the underlying data underneath that? Where do you need to enhance and amend that? We know that carriers are already starting to look at that and they will be driving improvements um, through their cover holders and working towards them because otherwise DDM is not gonna accept the data um, from, you, from your team. Now, given this is a data project and a transformation project, what skills do you have in house to be able to manage that? Have you got data specialists? Who's going to manage this? Is this an IT project, an MI project, a change project, a BI project? Where does it sit? And where does it sit with the um, with the other business um, in, with the other kind of business areas that you're looking at? Is it a top priority or is it a middle priority? How are you going to resource this moving forward? I think the other. I know we've got some software development partners sat out in the ether as well. But what are they doing in this area? And I think it's really, really important that as firms, you are really clear about how you want your software houses to interact with you on this and interact with Lloyd's. The software development houses are waiting for you as MGA firms to provide some direction and some requirements about how they want to operate. Um, we know already that people like Viper and Mortatrace are already very, very ingrained with um, the Lloyd's DDM project and working with Charles Taylor on API interfaces. But what about the others? What about your kind of policy admin systems? What are your providers doing and what do you want them to be able to do? And then I think the final question that you need to ask is with all that in mind, how are you going to proactively respond to the digitization initiatives by Lloyd's? I don't think you can sit back anymore. You need to make a call. So it's about having an initiative and a, and a plan to move this stuff forward and actually to really, really think about kind of what your response is going to be and what preparatory um, work you are going to do to make a real difference to your organisation. The next piece I'm going to cover off is the six must have ingredients for an MGA digital strategy, because, again, it's all around delivery. Um, so therefore, you need to deliver a data driven value proposition for your firm. Now, what do I mean by that? I think I mean that data is at the heart of anybody's proposition, especially in the MGA market. So you need to demonstrate the value you bring to your partners. It isn't about obtaining and maintaining capacity. This should be about working towards being best in class. Carriers are gonna get more and more pickier, I think, on the MGAs they're gonna choose and the capacity provision. 
And I think the one thing you must not forget in all of this, Lloyd's is very, very focused on kind of efficiency um, through the Lloyd's market. We must consider the forgotten partner, the policyholder, and actually how we drive value for the end customer in all of this activity. Um, we also need to make sure that di the digital strategy that your firm comes up with aligns to the corporate strategy and business objectives. This is not a small digital team sat on the side of the desk in a corner or at home um, working on it. This is a whole business initiative. This is about making sure that we know where our organization is going and how that helps the business achieve corporate strategy and the business objective. If there is no clear line of sight, then we need to go back to the drawing board on both, the strat on both strategies and objectives and make sure they're clearly aligned. I think the other piece is that data and digital is your corporate asset. It needs to be in a board and executive team agenda item. And I'm not sure it always is. It's kind of something that's done on the side by the IT department as a reaction. If your board and executive team aren't skilled in these areas, upskill them bring the additional resource in, get specialist advisors in to help in this area. It's that important. This will be your competitive advantage in your differentiator. Focus on the digital strategy areas that you consider are core to your business, drive value and support your competitive advantage. Now this could be done in a number of, a number of reasons. This could be a product digital strategy. It could be a marketing digital strategy. It could be pricing with sort of algorithmic syndicates and parametric products. It could be digital first distribution models. It could be service tailored to the individuals. It could be claims with automation. It doesn't matter which area it is. It's about being clear on what you think is core to your business. You can't do them all. I think we all recognize you can't do them all. So you need as a business to prioritize. And I think the other thing that's really key is to make sure that you've got your capacity providers on board. Your success drives their success. They're thinking about their digital strategy. How does yours align? You know, we've got lots of talk of kind of cover holder portals and customer portals and yeah. this kind of streamlining their operations and getting rid of board rows and all of these things. You know, if you're truly a partner with your capacity provider, work together and help one drive the other. And again, I mentioned it before, the end customer and the policyholder. You know, we're all talking about efficiency and effectiveness how does your strategy work towards better outcomes for these partners? Fab. Karen, thank you so much. And um, don't uh, feel like you've got to scribble um, very quickly. Uh, all of that good, excellent content. Um, these slides will be made available um, subsequent to the webinar. So thank you very much. Um, so now then, having placed all of that lovely content and those debates and arguments out there, let's move on to an expert discussion of the practicalities from some people who really know, um, neck deep. Peter, I, I, I did smile, but supportively when I saw in, in your intro that you have a complete understanding of London market modernization. Um, no, no, I'm not doubting it. I'm just saying, wow. And, and Heidi, my goodness, I've known you for a little while, but um, that intro told me some stuff that I hadn't fully appreciated. Um, some amazing um, work life experience as well as business experience there. Thank you so much. And obviously as an MGA, I'm going to come to you first, Heidi, with, I suppose, one of the most important questions, but potentially one of the trickier. But we know we can rely on you to speak it as it is, Heidi. OK, so my question is then, why is Blueprint 2 so important for MGA firms and how can they best prepare, contribute and also advocate for the right, the right outcomes for you and, and themselves? Well, thank you very much. And it's, it's a delight to be here with my uh, esteemed colleagues. Um, but knowing that, that we have a, a sharp time sense. Um, as far as preparing, there's a couple of points I, I wanna remind ourselves of. Um, it's, this is not just an exercise in uh, dealing with and managing Lloyd's and Blueprint 2. This is really an exercise in how we manage our businesses. So it's not, it's not only a question of, do you have a binder, do you have capacity with Lloyd's or not? Because these data issues and the, the core, the, the CDR is, is critical to all our business. It doesn't matter if it's a, a Lloyd's binder or not. And it's also critical as far as doing analytics across the spectrum of products and understanding your customer base because the better your data is, um, and that's one thing I wanted to really agree and something that in a follow-up, um, 
I'm sure people are going to have questions about how do they actually understand the quality of their data, because that is critical. Um, for providers coming in and starting as a part of this dialogue, I think there's some really important business drivers. One is what I'm going to call flexibility, and I'll, I'll mix that word with the word agility. So that when we're migrating systems, when we're be it in response to Blueprint 2 or in participation of Blueprint 2, it's not, again, just the Lloyd's business. We have to have those customer records and that customer data to both understand our customer needs, actually how is our, so it is both MI, it is both product, it is both pricing, but it really has to be the integrity of the data. And I'd say Lloyd's is gonna end up, the Blueprint 2 will end up being probably an industry standard, not only with Lloyd's, but outside of Lloyd's, because there must be standardization in customer data sets to actually be able to have a system which has different schemes on it and to both be able to cross market as well as to cross serve customers between different um, types of products. So I would say people are gonna need guidance about what is quality, how, how do they assess their data most importantly? And in giving feedback to either Lloyd's or their system developers, that standardization really needs to be strong enough to facilitate non Lloyd's business and to facilitate a variety of functions, be it analytics of your data or be it understanding again, how your book is performing in support of your customer needs. So flexibility, agility, because that also drives costs down because when you're migrating systems, you're able to effectively not ever lay a hand on it because you never want to do manual data key to, uh, to bring on a new system. Fabulous, thank you, Heidi. And, I, and we'll come on to dig into a little bit further into that, that really important issue of what is quality um, a little bit later in the, the conversation. So Peter, it's important, obviously. It's tricky for a whole sort, sort of reasons. Um, but why, just, just in a nutshell, Blueprint 2 is so important for MGAs. What should they be? How and what and how? When should they be contributing? And also this advocating piece as well, Peter? Would you, would you tackle that a little bit as well, please? Yes, yeah, certainly, yeah. So, uh, a lot of my clients, you know, it's not just about Lloyd's in London. You know, the work in an international market. And, you know, I've had the privilege to work with many people across the industry on London Market, Tom, and Future at Lloyd's, etc. And really, you know, it's about the future of London, not just about the future at Lloyd's. And the, 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 the companies are really struggling to become aligned, to uh, meet the requirements of the, you know, the core data record. Um, we're struggling with uh, poor data, the data is arriving uh, really late in organisations. The best they can do is provide a sort of a history of what's what's happened. They can't use the data for analytical purposes going forward. Um, so my, 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 my sort of bigger concern really is that a lot of clients are re-keying data uh, purely for the core data record. Um, and the companies can't wait forever you know they we, we, we've been sitting here waiting for lm tom to deliver and you know all the people involved in that we you know, with the best will in the world we all wanted that to uh, be successful and companies were put on hold and were waiting for solutions to be delivered and uh, they weren't delivered and we have the future at lloyd's and a lot of companies organizations are not involved in those conversations you know and as Karen referenced earlier, it's really critical for companies to be involved in looking at what that looks like and contribute to that. But I just worry that they're not being involved in that. And so people are telling me that it's extremely complicated to uh, have collect the data in the first place. It's even more complicated to do the, uh, the matching and the cross-referencing uh, to provide that data. Um, I think, you know, the fact that in the blueprint too recently, as Karen just mentioned, I noticed on the earlier slide, it mentioned that um, it, was, it was the last thing to be looked at. You know, North American property was going to be looked at first and delegated was, was right down the line. Well, as I said, you know, companies can't sit back and wait for 
things to happen. They're telling me we've got to do our own thing. We work in an international environment. We're moving capacity out of Lloyd's into international markets. And can you kind of help us look at the bigger picture? So that's the reality that you're seeing on the ground then. Um, yes, in terms of the timing. And then, as you say, people are not being able to just simply wait. And with the context of Tom and, and all of that good stuff as well. Peter, on that, not being invited into the conversation. Any thoughts then on how people can actually get themselves in the conversation? If that is a route that they think alongside doing their own thing, as you've said, as you've just described, to get their businesses ready, how what practically can can our listeners today, for example, if they what can they do? Who should they be reaching out to to be involved in in the conversations that are going to matter as to how these things eventually get sorted? What any any tips on that? What, Apart from talking things, to you. <laughs> one of the things that we're suffering with really is that we tend to engage with the same companies, the larger organizations, and listen to their voice because they represent the larger part of the market. But you know, we've got uh, associations out there that can really help us uh, in that engagement. And, th and I think that they they need to reach out and push really hard and say, look, um, you, you need to work with us and take, take us on the journey because I think a lot of people are going to get left behind, frankly. And one, one of my clients said to me the other day, he said, oh, man, you know, we're, we're, we've got too many people on some of these committees that are, are not involved in the business and we really need to get, you know, the underwriters, the MGAs, the brokers together, uh, less of us, and, and, and make some decisions. And communication is, is the key thing. That's not really happening within organisations. And Karen referenced, you know, uh, Water Trace and uh, Viper. And, you know, these conversations we've been having for, in my recollection, we started three and a half years ago talking about integration with APIs. We're no closer to that now. OK, thank you very much. So, Karen, lots to pick up on there. But very briefly, then, to this particular part of the conversation, I think we don't need to look anymore at how important why it is so important. I don't think so. So the top tip then um, for, for contributing and advocacy, because we're going to come into the sort of more nitty gritty practical. What shall I do then, Peter, Karen, Heidi? Um, but just just quick a top line from you on that on that first question around contributing advocating and preparing any any sort of words of wisdom there so i think it's um have the conversations i think it's a case of you know lma are doing their lma dare project at the moment so reach out to those guys because they're looking critically at what what lloyd's are doing and trying to understand that model um it's reach out to your software houses um it's actually collect the people the clients in the software houses no one's just using one solution you with one client everyone's got multi-client when you get those clients together like-minded clients together you then give the software house a voice because they can actually go and re um, actively represent you so don't be afraid of asking them some tricky questions and asking them what they're doing because they are they are the people that are going to have to integrate with these solutions kind of longer term and I think it's about making sure that you're you're knowledgeable and aware. I don't think the core data record was kind of um, pushed out in the market as much as it could or should be. Um, I think if you go onto their web, the Lloyd's website and look at the consultation that's going on, the same type of people are replying to this. They're the IT people, they're the data people, they're not the business people. Yep. Um, and I think that's really important that this is, you know, it's only the only point, the only point of capturing data is so that you can use it. And the core data record is about processing and processing efficiency. It completely ignores all the value add that MGAs and carriers are actually going to need to be able to analyze that book. But you've got to start somewhere. Yeah. So if you get the core data record and then we expand it over time. That's great. Um, but at the moment, I think it, it's missing a lot of the rich information that would actually really help kind of differentiate MGAs from their peers. Um, but that gives you a fantastic opportunity to go, not here's Lloyd's core data record, this is my MGA's core data record, and this is what I want to want to collect. Great. Thank you very much. So then let's 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 dig into that my core data record um, area in a bit more detail then. Um, and Peter, 
uh, three minutes, what Munge, if I may, would be saying to me as an MGA if I say, okay, Peter, Munge, I am ready to start really rolling my sleeves up and doing something about this. Give me the three minute consultancy, how to create my own core data record. Go for it, Pete. Three minutes, right, okay. So yeah, sorry about I that. I think the, 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 the questions that I'd ask my client really is, uh, what da what data do you think that you need to collect? Because a lot of people say to me that uh, to remain relevant in the future, we, we must collect as much data as possible. I say to them, great, what are you going to use that data for? So there's data that is must-have data, there's uh, data that is nice to have data, and, there sh and should have data as well. And generally, a lot of them say to me, oh, you know, well, we haven't really sort of discussed that in the great detail, but, you know, you kind of need to understand how you're going to capture that data, how you're going to supplement that data and how you're going to consume it and how you're going to pass it on to your clients, because you want to try and make uh, yourself an easier company to do business with and uh, easier to trade with. So I think that, uh, when you talk about a digital strategy, for example, I think that a lot of companies don't have a digital strategy. Strategy. They just think about, I must get data to survive and make myself relevant in the future. But we need to sit them down and have a conversation about, can you consume that data? Can you supplement that data? Can you take the people with you on the journey internally? It's not about an IT uh, change. It's about the business working with the IT team and making those changes within an organisation. Great, thank you very much. So, so let's um, we're going to broaden the conversation out a little in a little while, um, in beyond data, as it were, into the the digital strategy world. So, um, stay tuned, um, guys and girls, for that. But Heidi, coming to you around this piece of my my CDR, what do I need to be thinking about in the context of I've got a business model that I want to grow. I want to grow sustainably and resiliently and deliver value across the value chain to my customers and my partners. Maybe give us a little bit of an insight as to a real life MGA in sat in that seat, doing that thinking, making those decisions, working out what on earth that CDR should look like in order to support a growth model that, you know, and, and your purpose as a business. Can you just maybe share with us the kinds of questions, the logic flow that you're going through that would help um, other MGA um, listeners uh, listening to us today? Absolutely. And getting back to, to, to Karen's reference, um, there is a lot on the site, even if delegated authority is kind of low men on the totem pole at this point, And even if we're behind, um, there is quite a lot of rich data instruction and guidance about what the CDR should be composed of for, and it's, it's, it's so encyclopedic, but I think actually familiarizing yourself, especially if you're a business person and not an IT person, is you can drive great efficiencies and cost savings and time savings by, if you're not involved in uh, claims, for example, there's, there's chapters of, of data that will never be part of what you need to do. But you need a business person, not an IT person. And I, I mean no offense to IT people. You need a business person to explain, we're always, even if I don't, if I'm not a TPA who handles claims, I'm always going to want claims data so that I understand my customer profile, which is part of, as you know, like let's say for home and contents, a rating issue um, or a pricing issue. So the, there, I, I guess I'm going to encourage they're in the CDR and in what's been laid out, even if it looks overwhelming, I think business people, to your point, Peter and, and Karen, need, they have to be involved and they have to drive the process because they're basically driving the business decisions. There's certain parties that, are, that execute and there's certain parties that, that need to provide guidance. So I guess the first thing I would say is there's a lot of good signposting out there with the CDR now that can even improve what companies do on their own. Second really important thing is when we talk about standardization, it needs to be not product specific so that in, in essence, you are collecting and collating the same data on customers across an entire product spectrum. So your CDR needs to be 
flexible and agile. You might be collecting some more information from some customers about product X that isn't necessarily relative to product Y. But with that standardized data set, you're actually able to do quite a lot of analytics. You're able to understand how, what, and where is the amount of book versus the amount of time versus the um, renewability of products. I'm just trying to think of my other things from notes. Um, the consultation process, you can put your hand up in it. Um, I think it's a little bit disheartening that, again, most people on this call are, are part of delegated authority businesses, and that is really the lower end of the spectrum. But the other thing I would say as far as not only involving business people, but I think Karen made a really good point. Um, it has to be institution, it has to be basically organization wide. It's not just the IT people, it's not just the business analysts. It really has to start from the top and the board has to start getting their feet wet if they are not already by living in some of this data and having the, the, the data outcomes from that really be part of their strategy sessions and their discussions. Thank you, Heidi. So Karen, coming to you then and, and looking at this, um, yeah, just probing a little bit further on the business attitude to data. I guess a, a quick reflection would be some of the work that we've been doing together um, in Green Kite is sort of giving me some clues. It's definitely not an on expert in the way that you, you guys are, that the business does seem to be seeing data, data as a really a critical um, part of the core business, not just a set of processes that belong elsewhere, whether that's IT or um, border own management or wherever it happens to be, right? So, so this question of do first, I guess two two things. Do you think the attitude of business within MGAs and other firms is changing and has changed? Is it a widespread change in attitude to data? And then the second question is: for people sat here going, "Yes, please, I really do want my business leaders and my heads off to really be getting involved in this." How the hell do I do it, Karen? Um, what, what would you say to those two points, please? So I think the, all the Lloyd's work at the moment is actually about being data driven. You know, we've talked about transformation projects over the years. This is all about data um, and how data can enable us to do business better from, the, from an efficiency perspective, from the cost of doing business and from an end customer risk management perspective. So I think everyone agrees that data is there. We're in a world now where you can uh, do a lot of data enrichment. Um, so I think, you know, you can buy data sets, you can add data sets, you can merge data sets. So that's really important. We're in an environment now where the, work, the role of the data scientist, I think, is um, upfront within a lot of businesses. Um, but I think there's still some way, there's some way to go in the data science. And actually, I think probably a number of the MGA businesses at the moment might be thinking, how could a data scientist help us? And oh, my God, that sounds really, really expensive. Um, how on earth are we going to afford to do that? But I think we need to, to move into that area about actually understanding the insights that we currently have from our data. And it's really about um, developing a data culture. And this is something that I think is relatively new. Um, data has historically been the role of an IT team, a business MI team. Um, it's about producing high level kind of board reporting with the key metrics to so executive teams and board level people. Um, but actually, I think we're in an environment now where we all have to consume, understand, digest and make decisions off of data. And I think to do that, you need to have the development of a data culture within your organization. We've all talked about um, heard in the market about our actuaries, the new underwriters. Um, because, again, it's less about some of the old London market um, ways of doing business and more about actually what does the data tell us and actually being data savvy and being much, much clearer in risk selection. With the margins in the MGA space, you have to be really, really clear on what you're doing. And you also have to demonstrate your value to your carriers. You know, gone are the days where everyone wants to back MGAs. Um, everyone's a lot pickier now. And actually, you need to be maintaining both your business profitability and for your carrier partners. The only way you can do that is through kind of effective data management, understanding your portfolio, getting the right insights and then making the changes that you need to do. So I, I buy all of that, of course, um, especially as you're telling it to me, Karen. <laughs> right. But I guess uh, the question that I would is there a competitive edge in getting in incorporating data savviness 
as a core requisite for building and running a successful, profitable MGA now? In other words, you know, do you think that attitude of, yeah, in order to run this business and grow this business, I need to be data savvy as a, as a, you know, as a starting point, as any type of lead in any type of leadership role in the firm. Do you think that is widespread or do you think, you know, actually it's not that widespread. So if the MGA is listening in today, do it quicker than everybody else. There's still competitive edge for all the reasons that you've, that you've talked about why it is so important and why it should be done. Is everybody thinking that way, Karen, or is there still room for the, for the quick, quicker movers to get in there and do it now and better? So I think there's definitely uh, room to move that. You know, you can't build a data-driven culture overnight. Um, you need to find those data champions within your organisation. You need to get those people together, working together and seeing how they can make things different for your firm. If you haven't got those, you should be looking to recruit those. You know, it's not always about um, the people that have got the tried and trusted his history. You know, diversity of thinking, um, you know, we're very, very up on that. Bring those new skills in. Bring those people that have got experience of working within other firms and other in industries and actually how they augment their data. Um, there's a lot to do in this space. And I don't think it's just the MGA space. I think it's the carrier space, it's the broker space, right? All of us are competing for business, right? It's getting harder and harder to make money. Um, so therefore, data is your competitive edge. And actually, the quicker you can get your teams up to speed, the quicker that you can develop a, a data culture, the quicker you can innovate the quicker you can really start to, to leverage the power and move forward. Thanks very much. So let's move on to just slightly more broadly than, than data to digital strategy. So Julie, if we could move to the, um, the next slide, please, just for this part of the conversation. So uh, Karen, you've set out the must haves um, for a MGA digital strategy, and you've already talked through them in the intro. So um, at, in this part of the conversation, I guess, I, I think for me, um, is there such a thing as a right strategy and have you seen it? You don't necessarily need to mention companies, but um, just just three minutes or so to give us some insight on that. And then I'll then I'll be coming um, to you, Munge, and then to you, Heidi, on that. So I think the right strategy is firstly to have a strategy <laughs> and to make a clear uh, point of this is what you're doing. I think too often I see firms going and looking at all this fancy technology being sucked in by the sales pitch. I'm going to go and buy this amazing quote and bind solution. And then they get it and then they're like, right, what am I going to do with it now? Right. There is no um, driver for what products are they going to put on it? Do your customers actually want it delivered through a, a digital mechanism? You know, everyone kind of doesn't think about the commercial aspects. You know, if you're going to go out and buy a quote and bind system to kind of start launching kind of um, e-products, have a really clear line of sight of what's going to go on it, how much you're going to write through that business, what it's going to look like and what success looks like for you. Um, too often, I think people get caught up in the kind of the fancy technology side. I think the right strategy doesn't necessarily have to be a large strategy. We use the word strategy and I think it scares everybody. Small changes can make big changes within your organization and be truly transformational. If you're a small MGA with a small budget, you can still make big things happen through looking at your operating model and changing how you do things or automating a certain part. It's not all about big multi-million boardroom management solutions or data warehousing projects that never end or, you know, we've all seen it, we've all done it. It's actually about doing what is right size for you. If you understand what outcomes you want to achieve, you can build a digital strategy around that that's fit for purpose for your business. Um, I think the only other thing I would say is that it has to be business driven. Where do you think you can add value? It needs to be, it can be delivered by your IT teams, but it has to come from the heart of your business leaders, from the people on the ground who are really, really clear about what their customers want. Ah, thanks very much. So, so Munch, when you're looking at that list and listening to what Karen said, is there anything that you would add or that's missing or that you would um, you would reprioritize? I'm not sure these are in priority order, are they, Karen? But um, some some responses to that and in this 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 right digital strategy for MGAs, Munch, please. I think it's um, it's quite difficult to decide what the right strategy is for an MGA because obviously it depends on their appetite and what types and classes of business that they have. So, uh, you know, today obviously we're talking about data rather than quote and bind, et cetera. But I, I think that um, 
an observation is, is that what Karen's talking about, you know, the IT people, and she's dead right, that you need to get the business people involved in these conversations early to set the strategy of a company and then understand what do we need to do to, to achieve that. So I think, I think Karen's pretty much covered all, the, all of the key areas there. Okay, thank you. So Heidi, you are an MGA. Uh, you do have a digital strategy and or you're developing it or changing it or evolving it as you go, go along. Uh, there's no need to be polite. I know we can rely on you to say what you really think. Um, when you look at that, those must-have ingredients, what's your response there, Heidi? And, and also really interested, what was on your list? And just share a little bit about how Emerald, you actually got Emerald um, to the point of having a digital strategy. Um, without naming names or taking prisoners, um, we have had quite a learning curve over the seven years um, when we, we've been trading for five years over the first two years, especially before we started training, which is when we made our first system decision. And um, that is the highest expenditure we have in our entire seven year history. And we abandoned the system we chose uh, two and a half years into trading because it was third party outsourced. We couldn't get our bugs fixed. It was supposed to deliver X, Y, and Z and it delivered A, B, and C and it effectively didn't work. And it was, it was, it was a noose around our neck. So having the courage to leave a system, which is very scary to migrate um, to other systems is a big thing having discussions with potential providers um, about their system, about their flexibility, about their response time, um, talking to some of their other customers. Um, I think that's really, really important, especially talking to other customers. Um, because if we had done that in a different manner seven years ago, I don't think we would have had such a pain for, for five years. But system selection and the the partnership and it's not just the it it's not just if they can code python it's how many other insurance clients do we do do they have do you as a layperson if you're test driving a system does that system feel intuitive to you does it have things that you as a business person um need as far as standardized outputs um do you have the capability to have some of this in-house or are you forever going to be needing to outsource? That's a business decision, which depends on your solution. The one really encouraging thing I can say is, is as opposed to seven years ago, there are a lot of good IT companies out there that are insurance focused, that know the business. It's not gonna cost you an arm and a leg. You have to persevere. Um, you have to become knowledgeable. You have to be able, and it's a learning process, to articulate what you need. And it's just not what you need as a business person, but it's, you have to do concurrent engineering of all the different business needs in the company. But there are much more flexible and agile companies out there today that can meet. They can either do a plug and play, to Karen's point, on a small project, or they can do kind of all the, all the bells and whistles. And if the company, if the shop knows what they're doing, their greatest concern is going to be the integrity of your data. Can they migrate you easily or not? As opposed to, I mean, you're saying that's an indicator of someone that's really likely to be a, a good partner, as opposed to the kinds of questions that you would get from people who aren't in that right mind space to your mind. If they don't want to see your data, that means they're not understanding how easy it will be to deliver expectations. Literally, if they don't see the quality and understand your data, they have, I would say, de minimize, de minimis ability to be able to deliver to you if they're taking a presentation or taking a product, modifying it slightly for you as a customer. It, it all depends on how and where your data is now. Yeah, that's great. You've, you've moved us right into that really important space of how do you choose the right providers and partners and, and coming from a real life MGA that's I'm sure will people will be listening and, and taking copious notes Heidi well, um, just, again just really simple 
if they don't look at your data, they have no idea how they can deliver what they're supposed to deliver. Yeah. Munch, from your point of view, thinking about that, who, who, how do I choose the, pe the right people to work with where data is so core, but it many times it's, it feels like it's a, 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 not a, a decision that's related to data. It's more about some kind of solution. Um, and that's where the presentations and the sales process processes tend to be, don't they? So that think about this, ask these questions of potential partners. What would be on your list, Munch, for your clients? So. Some of the things I see in the market today is that we have an abundance of vendors out there all claiming to be providing and building digital solutions for us. And I think Heidi tells a, a, a good story there. You know, they kind of lead you to believe that they can build everything that you need. My, my advice really would be talk, get your business people involved and really put them under pressure to, to, to show you in a live environment what they can actually do and, and do they actually understand the details of your business or are they simply out there just as chances really looking to, to, to gain another client? And I'm, I'm sorry, but our market is historically, you know, things in London market particularly take a long, long time to deliver. And we've kind of accepted that as, as a norm and we shouldn't. And the other thing is, is that things tend to come in several times over price again, which we shouldn't really accept. So I think that we need to push these vendors a lot harder to uh, ensure that they deliver to time, they deliver to plan, and they have a good understanding of our business. And sadly, many of them don't have an understanding of the business. Thank you so much. And, and your experience is so deep and wide. I mean, you, you've seen it all really, haven't you, Peter? And you continue to see the same things, which is why you're saying we've got to stop just putting up with what we've kind of become institutionalized to up to now. Just a very quick question on um, involving the business, right? From, from the business's point of view, yes. who, who is it that they should be involving um, in this mapping and this evaluation of potential partners? In yeah. other words, is it the heads of and the directors, Peter, or, or is it frontline people that are actually doing the job in certain areas as well, to well, your I, mind? I can tell you a story about one of my clients, actually, and... Um, they came to me and asked for help on their digital strategy. And we're not going to talk about the quote and buying side of it. Obviously, we'll focus on the data side. And, uh, and I said to them, um, what is the problem that you're trying to solve? And they said, well, everyone's talking about how we're going to use data in the future to keep ourselves relevant and up to date. So coming back to some of my comments earlier, I said to them, well, what is the have you have you worked with the business people to identify the data to you that is critical the data that you should have and the data that is nice to have and their response was kind of oh yeah you kind of need to talk to the it people about that well actually i said you, you actually you need to talk to the business people because if you try and drive an it solution from the bottom upwards it invariably doesn't work and so we had a conversation and we, we sort of talked through, um, uh, OK, so let's identify what you do feel you need to run your business and give you a competitive advantage. And um, let's assume that you've got that data. How are you going to use it for your clients? And by the way, your system currently doesn't enable you to consume that data. So you're going to kind of hire, have to spend some money on enhancing your current systems. Now, there's a big worry there because a lot of companies uh, are concerned about ripping out their old legacy systems at cost. And so what we, what we did is we, we looked at keeping some of the legacy systems and introducing some low code solutions that could provide them with a workflow. And they were simple enough to use that they could bring in some of the business folk to get involved in that, plus work with the uh, IT people as well. Yeah. And once they, and they're still on this journey at the moment, by the way, but using the data, uh, it's, 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 it's low quality data. The problem is it comes in too late. They're having to rekey data into a number of multiple systems that actually is costing them an enormous amount of money to do that. And um, we need to uh, understand how we can make them more efficient. And um, so what we did is we introduced a low code solution. They bought in their business people. They looked at how they could consume the data, and particularly in our current environment where we have people working at home now, the solutions that were built 
previously, many years ago, are not going to be suitable for people working from home in the future. Yeah, that's another consideration, isn't it? So, Peter, I know you've got you've got such a, a, a treasure chest of, of, of detailed anecdotes and stories. Um, but I have to keep an eye on the time today, well, sadly. Yeah. yeah. So but I think that's an interesting area and people listening in um, familiarity with low code um, technologies and, and other options for actually making change that so that we're not stuck quite at all really in the same technological constraints as you perhaps would have been um what we what we need to do is 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 capture our data and use it for predictive analytics it's all very well being able to tell a history lesson of what happened in the past but companies now need their vendors to build mibi platforms that can use that and push the reports out into yeah. the business so they can make informed decisions. Yeah. And obviously all of that, again, comes back down to data quality as well and what you're doing with the data and what your business is in the first place. Brilliant. Well, there's certainly room for another webinar here, guys. We'll have to wait and see whether the MGA folks um, think that there's enough demand to do that. So, Karen, if I can, we're just we're now going to move out of the panelist session. Thank you so much. Um, and finish with what we're calling the leaving card. So, Julia, this is the last um, slide. This is based on you've uh, made the right choices um, for your partner and your solution. And we're now talking about implementation. So, oops, that's disappeared, Julia. Yeah, if we could go to six. Yes, thank you so much. Um, this is about this is a teaser, a taster for making implementations work. Um, and uh, we'd be really grateful, actually, if in the chat um, you could let us know um, which, if any of these points you'd be more interested in looking at in a little bit more depth on a future on future occasions. And I think maybe, Peter, that's where low code and other options and, and Heidi data augmentation, API and predictive um, could come into the picture in a bit more detail as well. So, Karen, do you just want to um, to, to talk to this um, making data driven technology implementations work? Yeah. That's fine. So yeah, again, you're only going to spend the money if it adds true value to your business. So actually, what I think people do don't do enough of is what does success look like? It's not a case of well, we've got a new system. Brilliant. That's success. Success is actually using it, leveraging it, making sure that it's giving you the value that you're expecting to both yourself, your partners, your customers and your policyholders. So it's to be really clear what good looks like and good can look different in six, 12 and 18 months. So don't be afraid of doing various phase implementations. We need to think of data beyond blueprints. Um, that's only half the story. It's actually about what data is gonna add to your business processes. You know, it's all the things that Peter's been talking about. Um, how's it gonna help your underwriting and claim strategy, your proactive risk management? How's it gonna stop people having claims before they have claims? What can we do? What can we offer them? The world of insurance is changing. It's not just about being reactive now. It's actually about being proactive. The MIBI, data and analytics and insight elements of projects, always at the end. Everyone thinks about them at the end once they've done the really hard bit about getting the systems in. Please, please don't do that. These are the primary reasons for running these projects and should be treated as one of the most important parts of the requirements gathering. It's only worth capturing if you're going to get the information out and you're going to do something with it. So make sure you think about that up front. I think the finding the right technology partner and solution for your business isn't just about functionality. It's actually about capability of your vendor, their culture, their customer mindsets. It's never about just buying something, putting it in and never having to deal with these guys ever again. Think of it as a true partnership. Who do you want a true partnership with? Who do you believe understands your business and can deliver you value? And then I think it's actually around what is the data culture? We talked about it earlier. It's much wider than MI and BI and IT teams. It's everybody's job. So how do you make a non-data savvy organization more data driven? You know, and that is a journey and that is a tra that's training, that's exposure, that's helping people understand their role in the business and actually driving kind of data as being core to everywhere, everyone and everything that people do. Um, it's not going to happen overnight. But if you don't make a um, focused attempt at moving it forward, you're never going to achieve it. Thanks so much. And um, I'm very aware that we're coming to the end of our time. We don't want to keep you any longer than you've um, committed to, to staying with us today. So 
there's lots to carry on with, lots to continue talking about, we think, and we'll test out a few more ideas with um, our MGA colleagues with you um, over the coming weeks. We'll also be making various bits of content available with the MJA, but also through Green Kite. So thank you so much for your time and attention. Um, uh, please join me in thanking Karen Stanford, Peter Munjim and Heidi McCormack for sharing their experience and their insights today. Hope you've got a lot out of it. We look forward to hearing from you via the um, evaluation. Julia, over to you. Thanks very much, Sean. And of course, thank you to Karen, Peter and Heidi. Um, really interesting conversation and, and so much food for thought. I mean, you know, it does make the mind spin a little bit. However, Karen, I particularly liked your comment that small changes can make big changes in terms of strategy because I think everybody is so busy getting on with the day-to-day -day business of um, you know the, the issuing policies and, and every aspect that goes with running an MGA that strategy whilst essential can I imagine seem a bit daunting so I think that was a, a good point. Um, for anybody who wants to know more about the uh, core data records project there is a website that you can go to and actually review the core data template as it is at the moment this is about the first iteration um, so we'll be happy to send out the link to the Lloyd's website for that should you wish to go and have a look at the core data template and where they're up to at the moment um, once again thank you to Green Kite and Sean, Karen, Peter and Heidi we really do appreciate your time and your wise words and your knowledge so thank you for that um, for the participants again thank you for joining us um, we do have our MGAA survey landing tomorrow so please please do complete that because your views are incredibly valued to the exec team here at the MGAA and we want to make sure that your membership is as valuable as, as can be and, and that's our job to make it so so please complete the survey and return that to us um, and make time to give consideration to what you want your membership to be. Um, so once again, thanks very much. I'm going to leave it there and uh, I hope everybody will have a really good day and a productive week. Thanks very much. <laughs>